So let's talk now in particular about interrupt. So where do interrupts come from? Well, what happens is that the driver in the kernel tells the device to do particular things. Like for instance, it might set up an ethernet controller and say that it should start accepting packets. And then the hardware will often want to get the kernel's attention. For instance, if a packet is incoming. So an, an interrupt will be generated that'll cause us to go and run the trap handler and handle that particular interrupt. So go read the arrived packet, let's say, from the Ethernet driver, and then notify the driver that it has read that packet. You don't have to strictly use interrupt. So it's possible for hardware to just use polling. That is just to have the CPU be querying particular devices and see whether they uh, have input for them. The problem is there are quite a few devices and they would require a lot of going through each devices. And for the case of something like internet, it would have to do it very often because that stuff can be coming in so quickly. Let's look at a diagram of how interrupts are generated. So what we see here up at the top is the two cores. So we see that any local interrupts that are happening, like let's say a divide by zero, are handled by the LAPIC. So that's the local advanced programmable interrupt controller. Right. It's programmable because you can tell it which interrupts to enable uh, or disable. You can tell it which trap numbers uh, to go ahead and generate in response to interrupt. Then there's communication across the system bus because there are external interrupts that can come from I.O. devices. So an I.O. device can generate an interrupt. That goes to the I.O. APIC or Advanced Programmable Interrupt Controller. And then we also have, for instance, for PCI, devices come up in a different way. It doesn't actually use an APIC. It just goes under what's called MSI messages. So those are messages that go across the bus that say kind of an interrupt is, is, is uh, desired. And then that will eventually go up and get routed to a particular CPU. Okay, we don't normally have to care about that too much, other than the fact that we do have to do some programming, programming of these APICs. Let's look and see what happens when user code is making a system call to the kernel, let's say to do a write. Okay, so we've got some user code. And the user code is going to be doing some stuff and then issuing a write and then doing some more stuff and then issuing another write call. All right, so what happens on the write call? Well, this is going to go into the kernel. And this write call goes in to kernel. And what's going to happen? Well, we'll have some preparation for the pre-write code, right? So preparing that all. And then we'll do an IO command. All right. Now that IO command is going to do something like write to the disk. Okay. So this is going to be slow. And then we have some post-write type stuff. After the post-write happens, we come back to the write. So it's all sort of right in here. We prepare for our write. We do our command. IO command, and then we do a post write. If we're doing interrupt driven, then it's going to be slightly different. So let's look at an alternative kernel. So let's look at a interrupt driven kernel. And when I look at the IO command, the IO command may be something like send this write to the disk. And then it could just sit there polling, waiting, and saying, Disk driver, did you finish? Disk driver, did you finish? Disk driver, did you finish? And so on. This is all ignoring the fact that there's actually a cache when you do a write. So these disk blocks are cached in memory and written uh, not immediately. But let's just assume these were to be written immediately. So it would just sit here in a loop waiting for the, assuming we didn't have interrupts, waiting for the driver, uh, the, sorry, waiting for the disk to be finished. Instead, let's say we have our interrupt driven kernel. So what would happen? We do a write. And that would execute code that, again, did a pre-write. And then we would issue the I.O. command. So at this point, we have told the disk to do the write. And then we would return. The difference here is, in the case without the interrupts, we really have some code that's saying, wait for device. Okay. So this waiting for device we no longer have because we're not going to wait for the device. We're going to just move ahead and let the device go around, go ahead and do its own thing. So the thing is we want to know when the device is done. So at some point, 
what's going to happen? There's going to be an interrupt, and that's going to tell us, oh, it's done. So interrupt comes in to the kernel. And the interrupt is going to go into the trap handler, which eventually is going to do the post write. So whatever was done here, after we know the disk was done, we're going to do over here in regard to the interrupt. Okay. When will this interrupt happen? So let's say we're running in the user code when the interrupt happens. That's going to jump us out. So let's say it happens right here. So we were about to execute that instruction. Instead, we get interrupt. We go to the trap handler. We're now in kernel mode. It goes ahead, figures out what it is. It does the post write, and then we return back to here. So as far as this code is concerned, there's no difference. Except for the fact that the write call was a lot quicker because we did not wait for the device to acknowledge that the write had completed. In some cases, we might want to know that our system call isn't going to complete until it's actually gotten all the way to disk and we've confirmed it, right? That might be important for particular kinds of applications. But in this particular case, we're assuming that it's enough to have told the disk, the disk to write it and that we don't have to actually wait for the acknowledgement. So the acknowledgement is delayed. Similarly, if uh, we had incoming data coming from a device. Again, we could get interrupt at any call at, at any point in time, and it would go ahead and uh, actually get the data from the device. Let's talk now about the interrupt cycle. So what happens is at the beginning of the fetch, decode, execute uh, cycle, the CPU checks for interrupt. Okay, so if there's no interrupt, Then we fetch the next instruction. If there's an interrupt pending, and I'm going to put asterisks there because we're going to come back to it, then what happens? Then we're going to stop whatever is executing now. Okay, what does the hardware do? So it saves the context on a stack. It will go ahead and make sure you're in kernel mode. That is, if you're in kernel mode, you'll stay in kernel mode. And if you're in user mode, you go into kernel mode. And then it will set the instruction pointer based on the interrupt descriptor table. Then your trap handler runs. And when it's done, it does an interrupt return, which will restore the context and go back to where you were. The context, so this context that's saved includes the instruction pointer, that is going to be the instruction pointer for the next instruction because we have that's, that's the next one we want to execute. This asterisk appears here for a couple reasons. One, a CPU can just turn off interrupts okay, and say, I don't want to get interrupted. Uh, so other than a, a, hand, a small handful of non-maskable interrupts, that is ones that can't be turned off, then you will not get interrupted. Second, you can specify in your descriptor table that particular interrupts shouldn't happen while you're in kernel mode, so they'll only happen in user mode. And third, there is actually a level of precedence of interrupt. So if you're in the middle of handling a higher level precedent interrupt, a lower level one will not interrupt you. The user stack is not okay to use when interrupt happens because there's nothing that forces the user program to have the ESP set to a reasonable value. It might be set up into kernel space, for example, into code, and we certainly wouldn't want the uh, hardware to push some state information onto you know, kernel code, let's say. So we're switching from user mode to kernel mode. If we're in kernel mode already, yes, we can trust the ESP. But if we're not in kernel mode, we can't trust the ESP. So what happens is that we have these task state segments, TSSs, Okay, and these task state segments will define for a CPU. So there's one per CPU, and it defines what stack should use. So in the case of XV6, we have a CPU. Multiple CPUs can be running kernel code at a time, and so therefore they have their own stack for each one. So if we look at the TSS, there's a different TSS for each, each one that sets up a different stack. So we mentioned this nested interrupt handling where there, you're in the midst of executing a lower priority interrupt and a higher one comes along. XV6 doesn't actually support that. Uh, it waits until the current interrupt has been handled before it handles a new one. 
So basically sets it up so that if you're in kernel mode, it doesn't handle an interrupt, only if you're in user mode. So then when you re return from handling an interrupt and when you're back in user mode, you can handle the next interrupt. Part of the reason for that has to do with the kernel stack. So the kernel stack is handling the stack that we need for handling an interrupt. So we have to determine when we're handling an interrupt, which is the interrupt handling code that is going to push the most on the stack and make sure we have enough space for that. If we had a nested interrupt, we would have to handle not just the worst case interrupt, but actually sum together all of the possible interrupts that could be uh, uh, in progress at a single time. So interrupts, interrupt handlers introduce some concurrency issues, right? Because if, well, if we're in user mode, the only potential problem is if an interrupt itself causes a call back into user mode. If we're in kernel mode, though, and we're executing the kernel, then we could be manipulating a data structure in the kernel and then also have an interrupt handler that gets called while we're manipulating the data structure that itself wants to deal with the data structure. So we have a potential problem. So in the kernel, what we often do is want to lock code around the critical section. The simplest way to do that, so we're in the kernel, we have a critical section. What we can do is just issue a CLI, which turns off the interrupt. And then when we're done with that, an STI, which sets the interrupts back on. There are other ways to deal with locks, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those later. But this is a, a not uncommon way of dealing with making sure that we don't have any collision between interrupt service routines dealing with data structures and our kernel dealing with data structures. Let's talk now about interrupts versus polling. So there's a cost to interrupt, all right? They take on the order of, let's say, a microsecond, right? We've got to save and restore state. Uh, we, have, we have a cache miss usually, so we have to go to main memory to get to the IDT and so on. Some devices can generate interrupts faster than one per microsecond. For example, gigabit ethernet. So, and when I say that the interrupt takes approximately one microsecond, what I really mean is that the overhead of the interrupt is one microsecond. What if you have interrupts coming in faster than that? You're gonna get behind, right? You're gonna, you're gonna lose information. So instead, it, what you can do is you can go ahead and start polling in this case. So if you write your device driver correctly, you can go ahead and poll because the cost to poll is just really usually going to look at a particular register in the hardware, which means to just go read a value from the device I.O. space in the, in the, in the memory mapped I.O. space. But it's waste if there's nothing waiting. So different devices may choose to do polling or interrupt. So for instance, for a keyboard, you'd waste a lot of time polling, right? Because that just doesn't happen very often if you've got, even if you've got a very fast touch typist. So this would be better for interrupt driven. If you had gigabit ethernet, for example, this might be better suited for polling. At least if it's actually generating data. If you've got no network traffic, then again, it's kind of a waste to pull. So what you might want to do is switch dynamically based on the rate. So if you're getting a lot of interrupts, then switch over to polling mode. If you're getting few interrupts, then move back to just interrupt mode. And when I say you're getting, yeah, basically look at that interrupt rate. And so as rate moves up, switch to polling. So that's really what you need to know about interrupt.